Welcome to Art Slice Podcast, a palatable serving of art history. I'm Stephanie Duenas. And I'm Russell Shoemaker. This week, we are discussing Martin Wong's painting called Attorney Street Handball Court with autobiographical poem by Pinheiro from 1982 to 1984. So I know I play a bit of a dummy here, play a bit of a heel, but kind of an anti- but of a loaf. Well, a little more regal. Than I, that. You call the you call it a heel. I call it the butt of the, the butt loaf. of the the I, loaf. See, I don't the want best the part of the bread. I don't like the butt. The heels are the best part of the bread. It's almost like a little bun. It ain't right. It's like bonus. You know what I mean? You have the bread, but then you get one hamburger bun. It ain't natural. Anyway, I introduced you to Martin Wong. Sure did. Is that correct? You already said it was. Yeah, I thought you were just like kind of making the point that you did introduce me. Yeah, to yeah, I am kind of making the point. He did. And what uh, what were your initial thoughts? I don't want to hear your final judgment yet. So what did you first think? Um, I was a little confused. You were confused. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> you're just like, hey, check out Martin Wong, and I'm like, mm, okay, cool. Looked him up, scrolling. I was just like, why? What exactly about this? Oh, okay. Did he think I might enjoy? Well, okay. Um, but you have good taste in stuff, so I was like, mm, well, it's here you. somewhere. It's here somewhere. Um, and as I'm like scrolling down, scrolling through, I start to notice that a lot of the figures in his paintings are people of color. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well maybe, maybe, um, he's Latinx. Okay. Maybe it, his name is Martin Wong. Yeah. Right. And I just like, I, I read it wrong. I, I did the American thing like Martin Wong, maybe. Martin. Um, so. Martin, that, get in here. Get your oatmeal, Martin. So that, that kind of caught my attention. And then from there, um. It just it got more interesting, um, but at first I think I I was confused because the palette is very dull. I was thinking like what a boring palette because it's like a lot of earth tones, yeah. kind of muddy, kind of darker. Um, I definitely got some '90s vibes. And, '90s vibes. Yeah, and I'll tell you why now that I'm thinking about it. Um, because he has a, he uses a lot of brick, and we'll we'll talk about that. A lot of brick, a lot of like st- sort of street scenes, not not street, but like outside urban neighborhood sort of thing um it reminded me of like hey arnold because they're in new what? york and they hang out outside there's a lot of brick oh my gosh yeah and i was just and that's why i'm like getting like these 90s vibes like why do i feel I like i gotta a, look that up now i don't know where you're getting the hey arnold thing they hang out on the stoop yeah i know they're outside yeah but hey arnold's way more colorful i know i'm just as far as like the brick mm. specifically the brick i'm thinking of like 90s new york Lower income neighborhood because that's street wise, multicultural, lower class kids. Mm-hmm. And in my personal work, my not talk about my work, but my work is very uh, bright and sparkly and iridescent. So when I looked at Martin Wong's work, it was kind of the opposite. I mean, it's it's got its own thing going in completely different ways. So that's all. That's the only reason why I mentioned the the color palette. Okay. In particular, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we'll get into it. I'm I'm excited to hear what your final judgment is. But first, we have another entry to add to our art slice pantry. I know I picked up something at the store. <gasps> Was me... it clothing? Was it shoes? Was it totes? So today's entry is canvas. Stephanie, do you know what canvas is? You do. You're nodding your head appropriately. Canvas is a heavy duty woven fabric. It's used for a variety of things. Um, artists have been using it since the 14th century to, drumroll please, paint on. There are a couple types of canvas. Most frequently, they're just made of cotton or linen. Historically, I heard that it was maybe made of hemp. Linen tends to have a much rougher texture, whereas cotton tends to be smoother. So in linen, um, sometimes you'll see the actual like fabric kind of working its way through the painting like... And some people prefer that. Typically, artists will stretch canvas across wooden stretcher bars. Then they will put coats of primer on top of the canvas. Why don't you explain to our listeners what primer is? Well, I guess I'll go ahead and do that, I, I, I guess. I mean, it's jumping ahead in the in the pantry a little bit. But. It's a double whammy. So primer can be a lot of things. Uh, usually it is this thing called gesso, which is like a chalky paint, acrylic paint that you put like 
12 coats on at least or at least a few i i do a lot i do like 30 coats of gesso um but back in the day actually you might have used uh, an animal byproduct called rabbit skin glue oh no so stuff you know that stuff we put in our coffee every day that (sighs) makes our hair all lustrous and our nails all long so that when we walk across our hardwood floors we we tippy tap that is due to collagen and rabbit skin glue is a is a collagen of sorts the reason why canvas has been so popular with artists is that it's, you know, super durable, super stretchy. If you've ha- ever had canvas, you know, pants or a canvas bag, you shoes. can kind of canvas shoes exactly like Vans. It is a very durable fabric. Depending on how tight you stretch it, depending on like what surface you like to paint on with the canvas, your brush will react appropriately. So if you think about a very tightly stretched canvas that you can almost thump and it sounds like a drum, um your brush is going to react to that differently than it would if it was just on the wall. If you just put the canvas on the wall, you put the canvas on a a piece of hardboard. So really that is what's so good about canvas is it's very customizable. So artists can really make a surface that they enjoy working on. It's kind of like jeans if you think about it. Like some people like a slim fit jean, some people like a loose jean, some people, yeah, like a boot cut, unfortunately. (laughs) And um, some people like that real heavy duty denim that just like beats the shit out of your... uh, Another region. Oh, God. Okay. TMI. Thank you for that overly descriptive You're description welcome. of your nether regions. No, I mean, I wasn't describing those. I was describing the genes. You were describing an abusive. experience of your n- nether regions. Well, you wouldn't know. <laughs> no, and I, I think I'm good. I think I got what I needed to okay. know from your Maybe we should move, maybe we should move on. Maybe we should move on. Yeah. That sounds good. Okay. Just don't linger on it, stuff. You're always just lingering on things. I guess I just like to take my time. I guess I just like to um, take my time interacting with you. With me? Interacting yes. with me? Yes. But you see me almost all day. Yeah, but then I might not see you for a while, a few hours, you know, because I work a lot. <laughs> I work a full-time job. Just trying to enjoy the moment. Just trying to enjoy the conversation. I'm glad. I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, you should be sorry. I'm very sorry. I, I very much enjoy our conversation. Okay, well. Um, even if it's too much for okay, me or yeah. the listeners. <laughs> I miss I miss talking. You miss talking. I miss talking without like the pressure. Without of a phone being directly in my face like a solar eclipse. Casting a, a digital glow on your face. Yeah. Oh, I mean, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, like, human contact is just so weird these days, right? Like, you can't... Well, for me, when I'm out in public, which I'm... I mean, when I am, right, I work with the public. It's just, like, every conversation you have with a stranger is, like... There's just, like, a layer of anxiety now, right? You're like, don't stand too close. Don't talk too long. You gotta go do something. Yeah, you gotta go. You gotta, go like you gotta go. Like, so eager to talk to anyone. I know I've had that experience before, yes. too, where I'm like, oh, yes. am I slowly moving past the like plexiglass shield and breathing on this employee i know just like telling me how excited they are to be out and about and like or how their cousin got covid and i just like it's like whoa you know (laughs) (laughs) it's a lot it's just like okay but you know you're the first person they've talked to you in like weeks you know um i'm just i'm trying to get it's just i just miss just having just a natural organic conversation yeah with like this one in front of microphones totally yeah just like this yeah just like this. No, you know what I'm saying, right? Like when we used to venture out into the world pre, pre-COVID and you might talk to a stranger, you might say yeah. hello and you might have like a meaningful conversation. Exactly. Like you could be um, at a gas station rest stop and there could be 15 urinals and you could be at the one at the very <laughs> end. No. And then some guy from, you know, Arkansas or whatever state you're in um, might just choose to sit in the urinal next to you and just strike up a conversation even though it's two in the morning (laughs) okay 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 we don't do that um but so like that that conversation though you have with a stranger or someone that you just maybe is an acquaintance that that like that interaction gives you like a brief but like insightful glimpse into like how others live right in general someone who might not be in your bubble you feel like you're part of society you remember that yeah you're you're exactly you are a part of society that's a beautiful way of putting as it. As fractured <laughs> as that society may be these I mean, days. Speaking of society, Martin Wong struggled to find his place when he moved to New York. Oh, where'd he move from? San Francisco. Oh, beautiful San Francisco. Opposite side of the country. <laughs> so here's a quote from Martin Wong. It's summing up the, the paintings he did uh, about New York. Quote, everything I paint is within four blocks of where I live and the people I know and see all the time. 
end quote. Beautiful. It's very clear cut. Like it. It's just, Simpler it's just time. But before we get too far, let's describe the piece we're talking about today. So let's go to the narrative. Folks, you can find the image of Attorney Street. What's it called? <laughs> it's called <laughs> Attorney Street Handball Court with Autobiographical Poem by Pinheiro. Great. Duh. Of course. You can find that image and other images that we talk about in this episode on our Instagram page or on our website, both at artslicepod.com. Dot com. Dot com or, <laughs> art si- or at art size pod, whatever. You know how to find it. Art you guys size pod. Dummies. No, very smart. We stand on an asphalt court directly in the center of a large plain wall, which has been partially covered in graffiti. To the right and left, a tall chain link fence catches streetlight in fragments and is otherwise obscured by a pale gray night sky. The kind of night sky that is only seen in metropolises where it's never totally dark, but the dim streetlights only partially illuminate your surroundings. Directly behind the court are a series of solid but weathered looking brick buildings. Framing the city landscape is a rectangle of tiny painted bricks, a muddy earth red color, the same color as the brick buildings in the background. Then, as if that framing wasn't enough to make you feel the edge of this painting, a dull yellow wooden frame is painted around the entire composition. Here, the artist obscures multiple forms of language, like a poem painted in the same asphalt black, barely noticeable against the gray sky, a second poem seemingly etched into the wooden frame around the composition, street signs hidden within the painted brick frame, painted finger-spilling gestures on top of both the brick frame and the graffiti-adorned wall. Like a night in a city that doesn't ever fully sleep, multiple languages coalesce and hum on in the background. How do we find ourselves here? Staring at a graffitied handball court surrounded by brick buildings and not a soul in sight. And more importantly, what is a what is a handball court? It's like basketball. Is it? <laughs> yeah, kind of. But there's I don't see a hoop. I just see a wall. I don't know the specifics. So right, we don't see a ball. We don't see a a hoop, but we do see words and we do see finger spelling. And we do see graffiti. And we see graffiti. Yes, so... We see lots of different types of language. <laughs> yes. All right, so why don't we start where where we are in this painting? We are in the Lower East Side. It is a neighborhood of New York City, specifically. I'm aware. We are in the 1980s. Um, so at this time, the Lower East Side... Was full of boutique yoga studios. Um, wrong. That's how it is now or how it was at least pre-covid uh, okay so then um, maybe then it's just like filled with like seinfeld just a bunch of jerry seinfelds running around what's the deal what's the pre, deal what's the deal seinfeld. what's the deal they're all pointing at each other pre-seinfeld Pre- yeah so this is before all the gentrification uh, we like to call it yogification pre that it's a working class neighborhood with um a lot of people of color there's a large puerto rican population uh however it is like a dismal like urban landscape okay there's like buildings falling apart there's like literally like piles of bricks and rubble and it just looked like a bomb went off some in that part some of the city. bombs yeah i'm not gonna lie like it it looks like post-war berlin no and these pictures you have here are you comparing the two or are these both new york <laughs> no, it's that we're comparing the two. Oh, okay. Which you can, by the way, you can check these out at Art Slice Pod, our Instagram. So yeah, it's working class people trying to make it work in this really rough, falling apart neighborhood. A lot of crime, probably due to the fact that uh, there's not a lot of support. No, right. There's a mismanagement of city funds and drugs and crime are rampant. It's just, it's a tough time. It's a tough time right now in, in the 1980s Lower East Side. So this is where we're. So this not is where we are. filled with Jerry Seinfelds. Not yet. No. Okay. You're you're a little getting a little bit ahead of yourself. Quite the contrast from where uh, Martin Wong was just three years ago. He had 
he had moved from San Francisco just three years prior. Uh, he was living in the Height Ashbury district. The Ashbury, to- amongst all the tie dye t shirt shops. So I imagine in the 70s, it was just like it is now. Um, and it was filled with uh, tie dye t shirt shops and record stores. Well, that makes sense because um, this was. Well, San Francisco was like a huge center for the hippie movement. Like this is the happening. deadheads. Yeah. The counterculture is it's on the rise. It's happening. Uh, they it's, had their uh, free. Oh, the free clinics. Yeah. Free clinics. Yeah. A lot of cool stuff going on. Um, This the counterculture was led by young people. Right. So this is like a, an era of experimentation, you know, that included like free love or experimentation with psychedelic drugs. So Martin was, he was active in the Bay Area art scene. He was a set designer for a performance art group called the Angels of Light. He was also making ceramics at this time. Uh, He did have a degree in ceramics from Humboldt University. So he's making ceramics, but he's also drawing. Um, He's just, he's working his magic at art fairs. He's calling himself. He's a magician? In a way, he's making portraits of strangers, charging them uh, $1 each. <laughs> what do you think that Whoa, would be $1 today? $1 in like the what do you think that would be 1980s. Today? That's like uh, account for inflation and the minimum wage rise. I mean, that's like one twenty five now. Yeah, I guess that's not where I was going, but you're not wrong. <laughs> Um, so he, he was like churning out these portraits and he, he ended up calling himself the human instamatic, like get your, get your instant portraits here. One dollar, one dollar, you know? Okay. So he decides to embark on an adventure moving to New York city in 1978, leaving his life in San Francisco behind and he gets to New York and, oh, you know what? There's no room for a kiln. Okay, so he can't make ceramics. Did he bring his kiln with him across the? That would <laughs> be really so. frustrating if he if he like he's expensive. like, all right, guys, can you please help me load this kiln into my car? Just, hey, I just imagine it's like in the back of his trunk. I don't think he did that. I think he knew it was he's going be like tough. thirty miles an hour the whole way. It's probably not going to be an elevator. In- and then <laughs> he gets to New York City, and like every in every window it says for rent underneath it, no kilns. <laughs> Okay, I'm sure that's not what happened. No cats, no dogs, no kilns. All that being said, he turned to painting. So he taught himself how to paint. He he knew how to make ceramics, but he taught himself how to paint with oil, by the way. It's not easy. So he turns to painting completely once he gets to New York. Okay, so in Attorney Street, we have several kinds of language. Um, We have the overall visual language. We have poetry. We have fingerspelling. Which um, fingerspelling, for those of you who don't know, is a form of sign language. Yes, thank you. American Sign Language. Right. ASL, yep. So he was probably inspired by his multicultural upbringing and experience. His father was part Mexican, and so Martin decided to call himself a Chino Latino. I like yeah. that. It rhymes. I do too. Sup, my name's Martin Wong. He grew up, you know, as a Chinese American in Chinatown in San Francisco. So he's always had a soft spot for Chinatown. Uh, in San Francisco and in New York, um, something special about that place for him. So he had some eclectic fashion choices. He dressed like a cowboy with a Fu Manchu mustache. I like it. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like a lot Folks. of art kids had cowboy boots. Something. 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 I did, didn't you? Yeah, I, I did for a minute. Um, folks, if you see like a a weird looking person... And they're not clearly on drugs, or maybe they're on some drugs. Just, like, give them a hug. They're probably an artist. We're alone. We're alone in our studios a lot. Sometimes we express ourselves in weird ways, you know? Give them a hug. When it's safe. When it's safe. When it's safe to give them a hug. Give them a hug. I'm sorry. Give an artist a hug. As a smaller framed woman, I would not feel comfortable with a stranger coming up and hugging me. Even post-COVID, maybe decades from now, not even pre-COVID did I feel comfortable with that. Okay, well... Do you ever consider somebody else's perspective, No, well, maybe I'm more thinking about my perspective. Give me a hug. Give me a cake. Bake bake us a cake. Keep some cakes in the back of your car. All right. We're moving on. So, Martin was also interested in uh, Chinese painting. In particular, he was was really interested in, in the characters. Um, he he picked up some Spanish in the Lower East Side. Like I mentioned before, it, there was like a, a huge Latino population. Um, so, you know, if you're around long enough, you, you tend to pick up some words here and there. He was also interested in Americana and kitsch, particularly in regards to how tourists view NYC in San Francisco. 
his interest, I think, in Americana and and being an outsider. Yeah. So the view of the outsider into this other, this foreign place, right, is interesting. Loneliness possibly was something that inspired Wong to seek out other ways to communicate. Um, He was an only child. He was an artist. He was, uh, I say non-white, you know, he's just feel like there's there's a sort of struggle there for anyone who grows up in this country not is not you know caucasian so those three things alone right like i feel like are already sort of other you right like make you feel like an outsider already this those three things alone is enough and he was gay right he was he was he was a queer man like he uh, some of his most famous paintings are either about how he likes the smell of men <laughs> firemen <laughs> or firemen specifically <laughs> or there's a very famous painting he did with two firemen kissing yeah he is i'm not sure if he was like like out and proud you know what i mean maybe he i think he was out to his friends okay and it and came his... out in his work right it, okay. it absolutely came out in his work yeah. but I... right so all of these things could could make someone lonely right can't be yourself 100 percent. and sometimes who you are unfortunately in society marginalizes you he gets to New York City in 1978 and he moves into the Myers Hotel on uh, Stanton Street. And he, I imagine he's kind of like struggling right now. He's kind of broke. He made an arrangement with the, uh, the manager uh, to live rent free for three months if he repaired some uh, structurally damaged rooms. Uh, but he actually ended up living there for three years. I was just like, hey, you can, you know, I, I wouldn't just allow some. <laughs> you know ceramics? You definitely know about structural yeah, engineering. Just slap a little <laughs> bit of uh, a little slick clay. there and uh, let it dry, let it harden. I don't know. He must have proven himself because he, he got a job there as a night watchman, and that's why he stayed there for another three years. He got a job as a night watchman after one of the rooms collapsed, and the guy was like, okay, you clearly can't do this. I'm going to hire this other guy off the street who is a sculptor. It was during that time that he became interested in ASL while he was working nights there, probably because he was lonely and he didn't have many people to talk to. And there was like nobody that, you know, could listen or talk to him. So you're just sitting there like, sure. silent. So he was really isolated and he began to empathize with the deaf and the mute and began taking interest in finger spelling. Actually, one of his first series of paintings called paintings for the hearing impaired they're beautiful paintings they are awesome they're awesome they are check out our instagram for some images on that like they're so cool i can't believe that i had not seen them before right during research for this episode um so these paintings were some of his first to draw like critical attention like he got noticed for these mon wong's living the night work life he's probably walking around at night too, right? When why not? It's when you're awake, right? Maybe before or after his shift. Um, and it's New York. It's New York in the it's the eighties. You know we had to run into some sort of graffiti, like a lot probably. He caught some <laughs> kids uh spraying some graffiti on some walls. Probably. And that probably like obviously graffiti is a form of language in and of itself, almost a foreign language in ways. So he was probably very interested in that. Oh uh, it's abstracted language. Yeah. So as an adult, you think coming up, coming up like to these kids, like graffitiing a wall, do you think he yelled at them or do you think he was like, cool? He's probably cool. I think Martin Wong was like, cool. He's like, that's, a, he's like, <laughs> he's that's like, dope, cool guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're right. He loved it. He loved graffiti so much. He started uh, his own graffiti collection. <laughs> these kids are just like, who the fuck is this cowboy? I know, us? right? <laughs> just approaching them and like, oh, it's like, that's like out of like a David Lynch movie. Seriously. Like this scene right there. Howdy. Oh, anyway, Martin was a collector of things. He just liked to collect things. And graffiti was definitely one of them. But he also was interested in Asian antiquities. He founded the Museum of American Graffiti with his friend, what? Peter Broda. I didn't know this. In the East Village, which was part of the Lower East Side. That definitely became like Hipsterville. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, you want to talk about. Yogaville. Yeah. You want to talk about Yoga Fi. That definitely was a part of that. So. You know, the the museum was short lived, but how awesome is it that like A that he did that and then B like that it existed, right? I mean, this museum was a big deal because at this time, like graffiti was still like highly contested as art and a lot of it was still being removed, right? Like it wasn't recognized as an art form. Martin set out to preserve what he considered to be, quote, the last great art movement of the twentieth century, end quote. He's like, You guys don't know what you're missing. How cool is that, though, to be on like the precipice of like a new great art style and just be ahead of your time? Well, he had an open mind. He was there at the right time, too. Yep. New York in the 1980s. Pre-yogification. Pre-Seinfeld. 
Uh, all right. Multiple Seinfelds. You I just want you all to yeah, picture a bunch of Jerry. So just like same. Like In think of the pants. nine year spectrum of the the show Seinfeld, and then pick like whatever Jerry you want to. But there's just tons of Jerry's all running around, all upset about the same things. Just absolutely exhausting. Every shop owner. No, thank you. I choose. I choose not to. <laughs> So someone who was really close to um, Martin was Miguel Pinheiro. They were friends and they were definitely collaborators. Um, he was a key member of the New Yorican movement. That was a movement in New York City. I think it's probably made up of Puerto Rican writers, artists. Um, New Yorican is Puerto <laughs> Rican and New York. Okay, together. okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so he was a successful poet and playwright. He went to jail a few times too, right? A lot, yeah. He was in jail a lot. So I think a lot of his poetry and plays were about his experiences in jail. Yeah, and those those stories inspired Wong as well. Like there's a, there's some jail scenes and and whatnot in some of uh, Wong's paintings. So their collaborations like would combine Pinero's um, poetry with uh, Wong's like painstaking, detailed cityscapes and and finger spelling and whatnot. He was an important part of Wong feeling more accepted, more integrated into the Lower East Side. Because like I mentioned, it was predominantly Latino. And Wong is like this outsider, right? Oh, gotcha. Being Chinese uh, American. Um, that was a really, I would say pro- a prolific friendship. Is that a good term? I don't know. Yeah, they're collaborators. Yeah. And I think they, it was rumored they might have been lovers. They probably were. But, you know, it's... I. It's we hard can't to say, say that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. They made like some really cool artworks together. So Wong's focus on black and Latino subjects was in his work was not intentional, but is like it was rather circumstantial since he was painting what he observed in his daily life. He was painting the four blocks in which he resided. Exactly. There was a prevailing identity based theory in the art world at this time. Uh, which was for artists to restrict themselves to themes about their own ethnic and racial heritage. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, it stay kind in your of, ethnic lane. Stay in your ethnic lane. It kind <laughs> yeah. of feels that way today still, a little bit. Right? Still, Wong subverted this claim, but I don't think it was like a like an screw you. I think it was just like he was just being like he was just curious. He was naturally curious about all right. these different communities, mm-hmm. these different sort of worlds. Right? He was curious. Yeah, yeah. It was more about a curiosity, but also like observing where he lived. He's not like he was driving an hour to this neighborhood and just sitting there and just like, this is what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm forcing my presence on this neighborhood to make work about it. Sure. Well, I mean, if he is... It was, it was organic for him. Yeah. You know? If he's Chinese American slash Chino Latino. <laughs> yeah. If, uh, you know, he has family members who lived in Chinatown in San Francisco and had that experience and he's hanging out with like deadheads and going to art school. He's all these like different worlds, right? So he's probably getting to this point where he's starting to like find the threads or the connective threads between these disparate worlds. Like I could really see him having like just a a real true interest in all these different sort of communities and places and worlds. And does that sound right? Yes. But okay. Stuff. You're Mexican American. Yes. How do you, what do you feel about that sort of staying in your ethnic lane? Do you feel like it's positive? Do you feel like it, it can be hindering to you as an artist? Like, do you feel like you have to make work about being Mexican-American? I want to like counter your question with another question. Like, what does that even mean to be Mexican-American? You could be Mexican-American in the 1980s and that experience being Mexican-American is something different. different than being Mexican-American in 2020. Mexican-American today would vary from family to family person to person well that's what i'm saying but also like there is first generation there's second generation like and also you know what i mean like it just gets so complicated and honestly it's just like uh like that's that's complicated you know what i'm human and that alone every human has their own experience so absolutely i don't think it's fair to limit ourselves to to our ethnicities or our racial identities i mean definitely it's a part of you celebrate it make work about it but i'm saying like there's no reason to restrict ourselves to that right like, i mean it'd be so boring if we did do that you know sure i, I want to be clear i'm not saying like representation isn't a good thing i think it's a great thing but i also think like it can put this like pressure on artists to perform perform what? to only make work about that it's fine if you come to that naturally 
It's fine if that's what you want to yeah, do. Yeah, no, but if it's that's a problem if it's forced. Yeah, but if you want to make like Hans Hoffman paintings and you're Stephanie Duenas, that's fine. <laughs> I mean, like I saw all of these white people. I'm saying they're white people because I did. I saw them. Um, just all over the internet, just people posting stuff about making like sugar skulls or <laughs> like painting their face, like you know, like oh, a, yeah, for course. Day of the Dead. Yeah. Like, am I mad? I mean, I'm like rolling my eyes, but like whatever and that doesn't in like, some ways that educates them a little bit it, but right, if, they're, if they're recognizing the culture yes exactly they're learning about a different culture but if they're making like own. day of the dead sculptures and selling them on etsy that might be a problem then you're profiting from it then like, you're from the barrio those earrings I bought from, Whole <laughs> yeah, from the barrio, um, i'm like cool right. i'm supporting a latinx nope not a Latinx woman. <laughs> she is a white woman in Texas. From the, ba- from, from the barrio. Her name is Fur, and she's not from the barrio. <laughs> okay, she's selling it to uh, her. You know, I mean, her, her dad's uh, like a 16th. White suburban amigas. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, like, I think that that can be very limiting for artists. Listeners, like, if you have that experience, if you... If you've ever felt that way, sure. please share it with us. Um, we'd like to hear it. You can um, email your story at... Artslicepod <laughs> at gmail.com, I think. Just go to our website or our Instagram page. There's links there. There's links yeah, there. Yeah, we're not sure what it is exactly. <laughs> so, listeners, this is where we're standing. We're standing in the Lower East Side. We are talking about Attorney Street Handball Court with Autobiographical Poem by Pinero. It's oil on canvas, and it is from 1982 to 1984. I guess it's about 35 inches by about 48 inches, so spread your arms out wide. It's a little <laughs> bit smaller than that. Good. Good. Some people have shorter arms, they have longer arms, so that's good. Goldilocks. Yep. We mentioned that Pinero and Wong collaborated on several pieces where uh, Pinero would contribute his uh, poetry and then Wong would you know do his painting thing Wong made a lot of work based on Pinero's life after he died yes but this is uh this is a piece that they made uh when they were both alive and they were both so they directly collaborated on correct this. and this was an earlier work um in in Wong's career this So let's talk about Pinero's contribution to the painting. So like the title states, we have a an autobiographical poem by Pinero, which is it's the black text. It's painted into the painting. It's above the red, the red brick buildings there. And below the red brick border. (laughs) It's sandwiched between Actually directly below Eternal Street Handball Court, 1982. Yes. And I'm going to read it to you because it's very hard to read it otherwise. I'm going to read it out loud, um, but not in the toasting style. Oh, you're going to toast. That Pinero would have read it. That was his jam. I mean, your your body's already starting to sway in a rhythmatic way, so I think you're about to um, (laughs) unleash some sick beats on us it's okay your hopes up all right <clears throat> i'm clearing the throat okay. i was born in a barrel of butcher knives raised between two 45s on a saturday night when the jungle was bright and the hustler were stalking their prey where the code was crime in neon lights and the weak and doomed are no i messed up back it up back it up <laughs> Sorry. backing it up where the code was crime in neon lights and the weak are doomed to pay. Where addicts prowl with the tiger's growl in search of their lethal blow. Where crime begun when daughter fought son and blood was shed for the sake of bread. Where even God was corrupt. And few go down crying as go down trying cause life in the ghetto is a bitter cup. Yeah, it seemed I was a whore's dream. I knew the sleight of hand. Of a Murphy man, I could take a sailor poke with words. A con man spoke. I knocked out lightning, drowned a drop of water, put a handcuff on the wind, locked thunder in jail, slapped Slapped Jesus Jesus in the the face, face and and ran ran Satan Satan out out of hell. hell. Oh, my God. I don't like you reading over my shoulder like that. No, I'm looking at the painting. Oh, you zoomed in? Yeah. Squinted your eyes? Well, I saw slap Jesus, and I I was like, oh, I got to see what this is about. Yeah, so it's pretty wild, his um, autobiography that this this is here. You all couldn't see this, but Steph threw her microphone down, walked out, and eventually she came back and I'm kind sorry. of like composed herself. But that man, she was got she got into it. It was a little bit scary. Don't mind the listeners. Anyway, thanks um, for listening to my. She, she had her hat's on backwards now. But I don't have. A she hat was on. didn't even have a hat have before a hat. this. Okay. Martin Wong actually does respond to that poem. He does so on a teeny tiny plaque on what I believe is the actual frame. So his response is. 
It's the real deal, Neil. I'm going to rock your world. Make your planets twirl. Ain't no whack attack. No whack attack here. So he's like bragging about himself, right? Like the human instamatic. Like, I don't really know what he's saying. Um, so it was invigorating. Wow. Yeah, so invigorating. So that response from from Wong to Pinero's poem uh, was ba- basically saying like, yeah, I'm like, I'm I'm cool too. Like I'm gonna make it. Like I'm I'm a badass as well. Basically, yeah. I think is what it's saying. And then what gets even better? Okay, first of all, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's back it up. We said we mentioned there was finger spelling. Okay, so there's finger spelling above the plaque, and I sure did look up the uh, ASL alphabet and I <laughs> translated it, and it that is uh, Wong's response in finger spelling. You think he used like Google Translator? He probably didn't have that back then. Uh uh-uh, uh they did okay. not. No, he learned it straight up. Uh, I also think it's interesting that the hands are brown. They're like olive complected. They're not white, fair, porcelain colored. Not like my porcelain. Your sensitive dainty hands dainty. <laughs> that I have to adorn with a glove every time the sun even peeks out behind the clouds. You know what? Sun cancer is real. Is that sun cancer? Skin cancer. <laughs> sun cancer. Yeah. Um, it's real. Wear sunscreen, everybody. But yeah, he gets really detailed. Um. He's just very meticulous when it comes to to painting. So Martin Wong is not like, he's not a, a very abstract painterly painter. He paints like he would draw. If you're going to draw a handball court in a fence and like some brick buildings behind it, that's what it looks like. You don't see a lot of like brush strokes popping up in this, in other words. That's a great point. It's very illustrative with it. The sort of weirdness of this composition shines through particularly because he is doing that. So he's not like spray painting the graffiti onto the canvas. He's painting it painstakingly as as if he were like looking at graffiti and trying to like draw that graffiti. <laughs> so it's kind of like this weird effect because graffiti is very like lucid and free and, um, you know, kind oh, of has the funny. splatter yeah, and everything. True. And instead of being like very loose and free, this is a very like controlled response to it. I think you really wanted to get the details. If you look closer to the windows in the brick buildings, like he's got the reflections Super down. detailed. Yeah. The sort of like freedom and looseness that is often found in abstract paintings, you actually find in Wong's work by it not obeying like physical laws in a sense like the 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 fact that like the finger spelling are just like floating in the foreground and the fact that yeah exactly cuffs. like <laughs> the the sort of weirdness and freedom kind of shows up in just the way that he is so creative and, and strange with his composition yes and i think the fact he he's he's trained in ceramics um in that way like kind of those kind of kooky like quirky things show up which makes it great because it's unexpected well, and, and and like if you're if you're used to working with clay, like in order to be abstract, you have to be very almost purposeful with like the form that you're making, right? So he's very the used way to you making, mold the clay. And... Yeah, yeah, he's used to like the weight of those objects is kind of like showing up in the way he's painting. That's true. Those hands look really dense exactly. and chubby and firm. Like if you were to shake those hands, but like they'd crush my hand. And what I really enjoy about all the different types of language in this piece and the way they just kind of float. Like even the even the the poem by Pinero is sort of obscured in the sky. It's like barely noticeable. It's sort of the same color as the windows in the brick buildings. The finger spelling is like floating in the air. Wong's poem, his response to Pinero's poem, is like almost etched into the wooden frame, right? So it's like the, it it feels like it's just as like permanent as like the Attorney Street sign, right? It's like a it's like a plaque. <laughs> and then there's yeah. more finger spelling, like almost it feels like it's carved into the wooden frame at the top. So it's almost like if you're sitting in a train or something and you're hearing all these different people speak and maybe one person is sitting really close to you and they're having a conversation very loudly and then a person far away is speaking and you can only hear bits and pieces of it. Um but you're you're capturing little tidbits of like conversations throughout like this train cart. Um, maybe someone speaking in a different language. I mean, this is New York to me. Yeah, maybe this there's some New York PDA going on. Like maybe there's a, a couple like sort of just like mumbling and touching each other. Um, you know, there's all sorts of language, and you know, it feels like 
Wong is really trying to connect these disparate sort of misfit languages into into one one like grounded world. That's that I that's really beautifully put. I also just thought that there is no handball. There is, there are no people, but like just I think just by the way everything is rendered, everything's painted. And the way everything is placed, like you can just hear it. You can hear like the yeah. ball smacking the walls. You can hear the footsteps on the pavement. Like you can hear the chain links like jingling. Like, or even more, you can hear the silence of this piece. It, it, it's almost like the 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 conversations and everything were just kind of humming along, and you know he's he's just stitching them in there, you know. But right now it's really silent. And then we don't know what handball is. Like maybe maybe you don't play handball. Maybe you just look at it. Um, <laughs> you definitely play handball, but I, um, to your response, I think that that's, what's great about this piece or which is what is great about, you know, artworks in general are those that can like make every viewer respond differently or feel something different. So bricks are a common th- theme in Wong's work. And it's interesting. I know we're not talking about a lot of his works at once, but it's interesting to see how they play out because often there are a lot of like exterior Lower East Side scenes. And then later mm-hmm. in life, there are interiors, uh, places in Chinatown, San Francisco, whatever that is, he's connected to that space. There's something about that, that space and that brick and that, that sort of like physical. Physical environment. Yeah, that he's really into. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know where I'm going with that. But very much. I mean, he's, he's painting the four blocks where he lives right? he really like, is no that's very true that's where he's been that's where he was that that was his home he's painting his home these people this neighborhood this um the city meant a lot to him yeah he's speaking for other other people in a way too which is really fascinating like he's using their voice to speak like he's painting pinero's poem he's mm. painting mm-hmm a graffiti artists it's kind of giving him a shout out in in a way way, right yeah but i I just find it so fascinating that he is so interested in um what other people have to say well like shout out to the asl community shout out to those graffiti artists that are hated by like property owners like the cops and stuff and so stuff what do you uh, what do you how do you feel about the piece you didn't, you never told me what you what you think of Martin Wong's work, the actual like work. Like obviously he's dealing with a lot of interesting ideas. He's like melding these different languages together. But what do you think of his work? Do you like it? I want to say overall, yes, I like his work. There are there are a lot of pieces that I'm not crazy about, but I mean honestly, that's like that I can say that about any artist. Um, but overall, I do I I really appreciate his work. I've come to uh, recognize a lot of interesting aspects that are quite unique and i think knowing about his life and knowing about like who he was definitely helps um it's not always it doesn't always need to inform your opinion on on the work uh but for me it really did i think it helped clue me in to to what some of these works were about yeah i guess why i had a hard time finding something i liked is that it just felt like I didn't know where it was coming from, if that makes sense. When, yeah. I, when I first was looking at his work, I'm like, why is all, why, why all the brick? Yeah, why are you throwing all this together in these, one soup, right? Kind of. Yeah. I'm like, this is not a melting pot. This is a salad, but <laughs> uh, maybe I'm getting hungry. So yeah, I, I, I think it helps in this case to know about him. I like his work. It also kind of just flaunts everything that we were talking about, like staying in your ethnic lane just a few minutes ago. He's just a like big flaunt. finger, like yeah, a big, he's a big middle finger. That. He's <laughs> like, no, actually, you know, I'm a weirdo. I grew up weird. Like I know lots of diverse people like this is, you know, I'm going to tell their story. I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to tell my experience with them. Like the it's a human narrative. Yeah. So when we overthrow society, when we burn it down to the ground, uh-huh. this is a piece that we are stealing and then bringing to our free and open source art slice museum in the future. Uh, yes. So yeah, we're taking this one. It'd be hard for me not to just steal this and put it in my like bedroom, but as long as people, <laughs> as long as people had access to it, I'm okay with it. Okay. Agreed. Right. Cause it's sad when paintings get bought by like private, private owners. Yeah. Like, you never see it. They're like locked away in some and mansion castle sad. in Malibu and you just never, you never see it again. It shows up years later on antique road show <laughs> anyway taking it back to martin wong so around 1996 martin moves back from new york to san francisco 
uh, due to health complications uh, related to AIDS. Yeah. So yeah. They, they had a better treatment plan for AIDS in San Francisco than in New York at the time. Um, he died at the age of 53 uh, in 1999. So just a few years later. That's so heartbreaking because he would be alive today. Martin Wong was a bit overlooked in his lifetime, but uh, since since he passed away, uh, his he's actually he's gained more uh, more fame, and his works can be found in several collections uh, worldwide. Um, more recently, um, the Martin Wong Estate had a collaboration with um, a brand you may have heard of, Supreme. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm. Little collab mm. uh, that mm-hmm. it, so it, clu- mm-hmm. it included button ups, t shirts, hoodies, skateboards, ranging from mm-hmm. $50 okay. to $250. Yep. Great. Uh, but I think the silver lining is maybe that it shed some light on his work for these youngsters yep. that maybe would not have been exposed to his work at all or yep. art at all. So that's. That's something to celebrate, I think. I'm not sure he would have approved of the appropriation of their brand logo. Yeah. So for those of you who know the know the Supreme logo, it's definitely lifted from uh, an artist that we will speak about at some point. Anyway. Um, so do you know uh, at all about Martin Wong's work when he was older? And not so many earth tones. It's more colorful kind of takes it back to his roots his chinatown roots i don't think i am tell we'll me more to, we'll, have, we'll have to do some later period martin wong works part two yeah well, when we rediscover him uh middle cool middle like prequel sequel like saying? middle cool middle cool yeah what like you're talking about not a prequel and it's not a sequel because we've already talked about his death so it's like a middle cool. talking about the thing Huh? There's a name for that. It's the thing. What's the thing? Like, okay, uh, so there's a movie. Yeah. That's the movie, and then you have a prequel to that movie. Yeah. Or you have a sequel to that movie. Okay. You don't then call that movie the middle cool. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> well, but where would you put that in? Because we've already talked about like beginning to end. This is the original. <sighs> you don't. I don't think you. Can. I don't, I don't about. Okay. You don't. That's fine. Okay, listeners, if you have any questions or comments about this episode, please feel free to contact us at artslicepod at gmail.com. And we would love to see work you make from your four blocks. What did he say? What, what was his quote? Yeah, he, he, all the work he makes is from four blocks. Something, Everything something, I yeah, paint yeah. is within the four blocks of where I live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the people I know and see all the time. For your art assignment, go ahead and send us some artwork that you made from your four blocks. It's going to be of a lot of... Or about four a, walls. I was going to say, it's going to yeah. be a lot of interiors <laughs> and Zoom screenshots right now, probably. But anyway, listeners, if you see interesting paw prints, if your roommate leaves behind a stack of dirty dishes to soak why are you looking at me like and that? Uh, i don't know and uh <laughs> you know it creates a beautiful composition even though you're frustrated that you're cleaning it up again you know that wine glass could also have a beautiful tv glow or we'd love to see it and you can go to our website at artslicepod.com and see what we've made from our four walls um so that's kind of, that sounds kind of interesting there's yep. a little art challenge for you and listeners don't forget to rate and review like and subscribe, like like or subscribe. I don't know how that works. Us on all the platforms. It really helps. We're a very new podcast. Getting the word out is, re- is really helpful. We love doing this. And if you love us, please share. Your grandma, your uncle, your cousin, your neighbor. All right. So I guess we'll see you next week. And no. And no. Your kid could not have painted that. Bye. Bye. Bye.